Podcast Evolved, your home for Halo. Welcome, Spartans, to another Halo Book Club episode, a part of Podcast Evolved, your home for Halo. I am your host, Krista, and with me today is Aaron. Hi, guys. And we have a very special comic to review that you've probably never read or heard of. It's called Second Sunrise over New Mombasa. And it is from the Halo graphic novel. We're also going to be diving deep into page 122 of the Halo graphic novel. uh, Because there's a little bit of an Easter egg there. Uh, It's also written in the tiniest text I think I've ever seen. I was getting a headache trying to read it until I went on Halopedia. And they have it nice and typed out in a normal font. (laughs) So, before we get started, just a couple things. Uh, If you're new to the show, welcome. Podcast Evolved is a host to a variety of shows. Uh, This, the thing you are currently listening to, is Halo Book Club, where we talk about Halo novels, short stories, and comic books. Our other shows are Halo Headlines, Builds with Blocks, Halo Book Club, this show, and Mission Debrief, as well as just Podcast Evolved, which is our news show. Uh, which is cur- uh, Mission Debrief is currently producing their 20 for 20 series on YouTube. So go ahead, hit up our YouTube channel and see what we're cooking up over there. Our partnership with HCS Pro Talk with Will and Josh is uh, where they discuss the latest information within the competitive Halo scene with an emph- emphasis on community every week. So go ahead and see and take a look at their content. They tend to review a bit of a different part of Halo than we really get into. We're very much more lore and some of the uh, merchandise, and they get into some of the more esportsy stuff. So go ahead and check them out and see what they're talking about. You can learn about each of our shows on our amazing website, halopodcastevolved.com. If you're already a fan of the show, we would ask you to rate us and leave us a review. Uh, We greatly appreciate all feedback we receive from our listeners to improve the quality of our shows. We would like to take this moment to thank all of our patrons for their continued support. Thank you! Our patrons receive a variety of exclusive rewards, such as early episodes, unique swag, and access to our very own soundtrack featuring 18 songs. It's very... We used Halo as an inspiration, so if you like the Halo music, you'll like this. So head over to patreon.com slash halopodcastevolved to learn more. And finally, we encourage our listeners to support Audible, where they can enjoy a growing collection of Halo novels all in one place, along with thousands of other novels, guided wellness programs, and more. The URL is audibletrial.com slash podcastevolved to learn more and start your free trial today. All right. Into the book club. Do you want me to do the overview, or do you want to take it from here, Aaron? I can take it from here if you want. I don't mind. Let's go. (laughs) I will apologize to the audience in advance. I have the cold, so the quality of my voice may deteriorate as this book club goes along. If at any point I just crackle out of existence, Krista will take over. Yep. So, the first story we're doing is titled Second Sunrise Over New Mombasa. The author is Brett Lewis. The illustrator is Jean Mobius uh, Giroux. Is that how we pronounce it? Because it's the same as, it's Ben's surname. Benjamin Giroux, isn't it? Uh, I think so, yes. I'm trying to think back to my, uh, this is a sign that I have not listened to Hunt the Truth recently and should listen to it again. It's been a while. Uh, minor spoilers for this story. So the original publisher was Marvel Comics. Uh, There is a new version coming out in November. I believe by the time you're listening to this, it'll be about a week away. So that's being released by Dark Horse Comics. Um, The original was a hardcover edition. I think they're quite hard to track down these days. The new version is going to be paperback. And as of the minute, there is no digital version on Dark Horse, but... They have released digital versions of the other Marvel stuff that they've taken over, so if you uh, aren't into your physical stuff, you can probably get one soon in the future. The original was released on the 19th of July 2006. The new version will be the 9th of November 2021. This story is 16 pages in total. The timeline is pre and post the new Mombasa invasion, and that was October 20th, 2552. So this is all, it's all a flashback from after the attack, but some of it is pre-attack, some of it is during. It is, of course, set on Earth. It is new and old Mombasa. 
the main character in it, who is not actually named in the story anywhere, but we get details of it in Hunt the Truth, is Benjamin Giroux. I'm going to scroll down to the little bit of trivia because it's relevant here. The protagonist wasn't originally named, but in Hunt the Truth, he was named as a tribute to uh, Jean Giroux, who passed away in 2012. Mm. That's a nice touch. We were discussing before this that uh, we'll get into the story now, but the Ben in this comic does not look like the Ben I imagined in my head, and this guy <laughs> looks like an alternative character for cyberpunk or something. <laughs> he does. He's got like weird sunglasses and everything. He is the most badass looking fucker. He has a mohawk, he has blue hair, he appears to have some sort of like horn implants in his forehead. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like he's going to take on the Covenant all by himself. He looks like the protagonist of Halo. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, if you were going to have an RPG Halo set somewhere, it would be him. He's, um, when you make a weird custom character, that's who he, that's what he looks like. <laughs> like, your custom character in a cutscene. Yeah, I think in my head I'm going to imagine that uh, this was, like, Ben in his reckless youth when he was making loads of money and following fashion and being really cool and then he grew up a bit and like sort of started to enjoy cardigans and being a bit nerdier I don't know I don't it's it's weird it's a definitely a weird cognitive dissonance between how he's presented in Hunt the Truth and how he's presented in this particular comic I suppose we will get into it there's the story itself is quite short it's like most of them there's not a huge amount to it but it starts off, it's Ben talking about his life in New Mombasa before the Covenant attacked. His job is basically, he's an editor for the news. So he is taking the information the US, the UNSC are sending back to the colonies and he is polishing it up to make it seem better. Hmm. Yeah, there's a couple of panels where there's like a UNSC officer behind him going like, can you remove the exit wounds of these photos? And what is it? You need to make this look 25% more adventurous. <laughs> I was like, that, that's a good solid number of adventurous. I'm so glad we're getting that much adventure. Yeah. So he is basically a subcontractor to Oni. He works for another civilian company, but he is subcontracted out to Oni to manipulate the news for propaganda purposes to keep the people on the inner colonies happy. I like the panel where he's like walking through the street talking about it and you see the little captions of bits of conversations that people are having walking past where they're like, oh, it's uh, humans expansionist things that have caused this war and oh yes, I'm going to buy the new warthog because we need to keep the economy going. And you're like, oh God. It's like these poor people have no clue what's coming. Nope. Which I suppose is a good reflection on uh, Ben's work because him and the rest of his folks are doing a good job. He says there they are very well compensated for their work. And I like that he mentions that they are in New Mombasa because they're kind of being kept hush-hush. So they're not in like New York or Tokyo or any of the big urban media centers. They're just hidden off in this more... Oh, he describes New Mombasa as like, I think more like an industrial port city, really. Yeah, it's a working city. It's not a, like a tourist city. Yeah, but he does describe like a vibrant culture because he, there's a bit where he's in old Mombasa and he's looking at old school printed photographs that a guy's selling at the side of the road. And he talks about how he struggles to like learn the local language. And he's having to keep his translator on all the time. And then he's on the train home and space debris crashes down and derails the train. Just a normal day in the Halo universe. Everyone deals with that on the regular. <laughs> the train gets derailed and then 28 days later style he wakes up in hospital and the shit's hit the fan. As it usually does in Halo. <laughs> yeah, I think any time there's a crash and you wake up in hospital, it's never going to end well. Definitely, especially in, you know, any kind of video game setting or sci-fi setting. Yeah, it's, it's not a good sign. He wakes up in the hospital. The Covenant are in the middle of their attack. He basically decides he's leaving the hospital and puts on his first-person protagonist jacket and leaves. 
there's like scenes of the Covenant attacking the city. I like that. I don't know, the artistic license on that scarab makes it look like one of the walkers from War of the Worlds. Yeah. It really does. It does not look like a scarab. It looks weird. Yeah, it's very peculiar. There were a few notes in the trivia about some of the artistic things used here are very reminiscent of the original Halo before Combat Evolved. There's armor sets that are used that match up with that. There's also, I've just noticed, there's a character at the bottom of the screen being shot underneath the scarab that appears to be a marine with a helmet that looks like the one that the cyborg in, like, the Macworld Halo demo wears. Yeah. (laughs) There's a lot of touches. I think there's some brood armor as well. It's nice. Like, it's a different art style. I don't think... I don't think any of the other comics use it, do they? No, it's it's almost a it's a little more cartoony, I guess. It's hard to describe. It's it's very stylized. Yeah, it's very stylized. It's not as gritty as some of the other Halo comics tend to be. It tends to have like a very gritty kind of Marvel-y looking kind of thing. This feels like a mix of like Marvel and then like your paper, your newspaper comics is kind of what it feels like. It's very colorful. It's not as detailed, but it still gets the point across. Yeah, I do appreciate that it's nice and bright and colorful. Like, you go through all these panels and they all stand out to you. Just, sorry, I'm scrolling through them here as we talk. I notice at one stage there's an elite giving orders and his box where his comment is, looks to be like Forerunner glyphs, which I find kind of funny. It's those sort of roundy Forerunner symbols <laughs> and not yep. what you think of as like standard covenant. So he ends up translating a message. He picks up a message from Elite Chatter and hang on, I have the exact message here. It says, we need to clear this area before we can secure access to the Ark. So the UNSC soldiers that are with him tell him you have to get this to high command because uh, communications outside the city are cut off. So he heads to the waterfront and tries to get onto a boat to get out of the city. This would be probably before Truth has, or Mercy has... Regret? I'm forget- I was going to say it's regret, regret, regret. I mean... Before he slips based out? Yeah, it's definitely before, because that was like an apocalyptic event. I think he would have said something about it if it had happened. Yeah, probably. It's strange that they... Because it says we can secure access to the Ark. No one had any idea what the Ark was at this time. You learn about the Ark at the end of Halo 2, which is not even close to where this is being set. So it's strange that they were able to pick that out and see it as important. I suppose it kind of makes sense in the lore that the Covenant knew what they were looking for. It, this would have been back in the time when Bungie were still considering... They'd, they'd have still been considering the arc to be the end of the game, wouldn't they? Wouldn't this be... If it's before Truth, um, or Regret, Slip Space is out of there. Well, uh, it's 2006. I was thinking, is it before... Bungie, like, had their rethink on Halo 2, so it's set after, so, like, they knew at this stage that the arc was going to be in Halo 3. I was thinking more, because originally they wanted the arc to be the end of the game, and it was going to be on Earth, and then that turned into the... The arc we see now, yeah. Halo 2, Halo 2 was out in 2006. Yeah, that's what I was, I I forgot for a minute what date this came out, and I was double-checking there to be like, did this come out before? It was. It, this came up leading up to because Halo Three was two thousand seven, so this is like a lead up comic to Halo Three. So we are like us as the player know what the arc is, but also don't know what the arc is. But in universe, they have no idea. Yeah, but I suppose when the enemy are saying we, you know, we need to clear the area for access to the arc, that's probably as good a sign as any. Yeah, that something's going on. Ben's basically at the port. He realizes the boats are packed. He goes to get onto one. Then he sees a little girl standing on her own. So instead, he gives her his laptop and sticks her on a boat. 
and sort of hopes for the best that she makes it out with the information. That little girl threw that laptop in the ocean immediately. She's like, I don't know what this is. Titanic style, just chuck it overboard and away on. Yeah, she's just like, eh. She's like, oh, it's a frisbee. It's a good job it's not any child today where they'd be like, this doesn't have Minecraft, fuck this. I'm deleting everything off of it. So the last thing in this comic is then Ben basically in like his news control room. I get the impression he's going to like, in the hospital he freaks out that the, the news feeds are showing raw unedited footage. So I get the feeling that he's now like gone back to his newsroom to like do a little tidying up on the news and it finishes with, what will it matter? This is the first day of the end of the world. Great outlook. <laughs> yeah, so like he's he's dedicated to the end and that's where it leaves off. Like there's no more to it. That's the entire story. It's good. I think it's nice that they reuse this character for Hunt the Truth because that makes this story more relevant because it's definitely not... Without Hunt the Truth, this story is just a kind of throwaway little look into New Mombasa, but it's not even that good of a look into New Mombasa. Honestly, I think Sadie's story is a better... paints a better picture of what happens. I do like the little bit of the view into, like, civilian life on Earth before the Covenant attack. You hear about it in the novels occasionally, just how insulated the inner colonies were from the reality of things. These people on Earth probably don't even know that Reach has fallen. That's just happened, they have no clue. They're still talking about buying new cars and doing their bit, and maybe the UNSC were in the wrong all along. You know, they're they're having a very sheltered, nice existence right up until the moment that ships start to fall out of space. (laughs) It's like, oh, there's a war. Whoa, oops. (laughs) Things are bad, and it's bad right on top of us. Well, ain't that a bitch. And like we said, it's nice and bright and colourful. Like, I'm looking at it here. You go through all the pages. The only pages I like that are dark are the two pa- the two pages where he's remembering his, like, UNSC Oni guy directing him how to redo the news, and it's all red and faded, and he's remembering, uh, like, covering the insurrection and stuff and manipulating the news for that. Yeah. And they're talking about how, you know, we, we, we can't, like, let raw news go out because, you know... Uh, instant news about the insurrection wasn't great. Everyone received it, and it you know it caused all sorts of trouble. And this is why we do what we do. Although I don't think Ben would have been alive for that in person. No. That would be what nearly thirty years ago. Yes. Overall, I don't mind it. It's not a bad story. Like it's, it's like every other short Halo comic. It's. The art's not terrible, which is what really helps, because some of them can be awful, and even if they try to tell an interesting story, when you just hate the art, there's, like, nothing to redeem it. It's true, it makes it harder to go through. There's not a huge amount more to say about that, really. If you have the graphic novel, go and have a look at it. Like, it's worth a quick read, and then try and place that Ben in the comic with the Ben and Hunt the Truth and see how your head hurts too. It's an interesting experience. Yes, it is. The other story bit we have here is page 122 in the graphic novel. This is one page with basically some information on it and it sets up... I always wondered where this came from because someone told me this theory years ago and I was like, hang on, that's not mentioned in any of the novels anywhere. But I never read the comics, so that made sense. The two main things on this page are there's a section of a chat log between two presumably only staff, and then there's a section with a data query log, and then there's a couple of photographs around it and a few short paragraphs of information. But the chat log itself, it's a conversation between Mike44236 and Echo. 23023. We don't know who they are, but they're basically discussing a sudden spike in interest around, they say the ones, and they also later mention the twos, so we assume they're referring to Spartan ones or Project Orion candidates, and they say specifically they're talking about, I didn't put the shorthand down here, but everyone has like a code name, so Johnson's code name is like 
Alpha, Juliet, Juliet, so it's uh, Avery, Junior, Johnson, and then Halsey is like uh, Charlie Hotel, and they all have bits of their serial number attached to them. So it appears that both Colonel Ackerson and Halsey have made inquiries about Johnson's history. Halsey's request, both requests were intercepted, and they've both been fed a false version of Johnson's medical record. Halsey seemed to be satisfied with it, but Ackerson wasn't, and he's gone on to make other requests, and then that has been referred on to Section Zero, which I think is Internal Affairs. Uh, yes. I'm vaguely remembering that from our time discussing Oni history. Yeah, Oni has a bunch of different crazy sections, but I think Zero is the one that's actually public facing, where they're actually doing what they said they were doing as an organization. It's referred on. The data log on the other side gives us a little more information. It states that these data requests from Halsey have come in on September 12th, 2552, which is roughly when Halsey is on the Gettysburg in first strike and she's doing the run up on Johnson. And she has his medical files and she finds out that he was diagnosed with Boren syndrome on Paris 4 when he was holding off a covenant attack with crates of plasma grenades and the radiation damaged his nervous system and this is why he's immune to the flood. But this is actually fake medical records and the real reason he is immune to the flood is due to a condition in his nervous system caused by the original Orion Project augmentations. Which makes sense, I mean. Well, it kind of does and it doesn't. Like, part of me didn't like that at the time I thought it felt a little bit kind of like sort of weird and backtracky to suddenly make Johnson a Spartan 1 or an Orion candidate. And it just seemed cooler that he was just a badass regular human. For a long time, I did not appreciate it. As much as I like Johnson and he's a badass, it doesn't make sense because the Flood is just so overwhelming. It would be so difficult, in especially the Installation Zero Force situation, to make it out as a normal human that does not have an immunity to the Flood. Because like even if you read the Flood, even Master Chief has a hell of a time getting out of Installation Zero Four, and he's in a suit of crazy armor stuff. I don't know, I just liked what they had in First Strike, where it was just like... The flood attacked me, they latched onto me, and I woke up later and the flood was dead and I just, like, got the hell out of there. Like, that seemed as good a thing to me as any. It's strange that they redacted it and did this like this. I don't know, it feels weird. There is some information on it as we get on down here, so I can go into that in a minute. We have the other bit of information on this uh, relates to the photographs. There is one of Johnson, he's on a table with a stanchion rifle, and the other one is someone exploding in a jeep. Oh, very nice. This refers to, there's Operation Kaleidoscope mentioned, and this is one of the anti-insurrection operations where they decided that instead of like all-out warfare with insurrectionists, they would have soldiers assassinate key figures. So this particular assassination is March 13th, uh, 2502, and it's Johnson killing Gerald Ander, and he is the leader of the Secessionist Union. This is back to the old thing, the same as when Blue Team are sent to go and take out uh, the guy in the asteroid whose name I cannot now remember. Yeah, neither can I. <laughs> but he was the insurrection head, yeah. Yeah, you, you don't fight them head to head, you take out key figures, cut the head off, and cripple the organization this all adds to johnson being project orion project orion's mentioned in contact harvest as part of his military career this is all set up to basically make johnson a spartan one we get on to the trivia which is where this comes from first part of it was that johnson's supposed biological immunity to the flood as a result of Barron syndrome was originally presented as factual in first strike Bungie disliked the notion of flood immunity estab and established the disease as being fictitious in page 122 of the graphic novel. This is, goes back to... Uh, Halopedia links out to an interview with Joseph Staten where basically they didn't want natural immunity to the flood. So they 
put this page in to go that actually the disease is fake and Johnson was a Spartan one. And then we get the Breaking Quarantine comic where instead of Johnson being infected by the flood, he fights his way out. And then this is where we get at the start of Halo 2 when the guy in the army asks Johnson, is he ever going to tell him how he got out? And he says, that's classified. Yeah. This is Bungie going back and changing that because they don't like the Baron syndrome angle. I mean, that's fine. It's one of those things. I think 343 have kind of come along later and merged the two and been like, he does have an illness. It is Baron syndrome, but Baron syndrome isn't caused by what everyone thinks it's caused by, and it's actually caused by the Orion augmentations. So they have kind of like straddled the line between the two, which I suppose makes sense. Yeah, they kind of married the two and made the most of it, I guess. <laughs> that has been... I feel like that's been a lot of 343's time with Halo. Is just like, Bungie did this, now we need to like m- mash them together and make them work. Yeah. It's, it's worked out well, though, I think, in the long run. Yeah, for the most part, it's pretty good. Like, I... As time's gone on, I have softened on the whole... Johnson being a, an Orion candidate and being augmented, it doesn't bother me like it did at the time when I first heard this. So uh, they touch on it again in uh, Silent Storm. I think they bring it up there as well. I think they've done a pretty good job of going back and tying all that together. So it's a thing. That's it. It's just one page. It's just information. You can go and have a look at it and read the tiny, tiny font, or you can go to Halopedia and read it there. Much better experience. Highly recommend it. Yeah, don't don't read it out of the book. It's a nightmare. The Halopedia article is literally called, like, Halo Graphic Novel, page 122, so you can find it very easily. <laughs> yeah, and there's a few other little things you can go through there. It mentions how there's discussion of a character who is in I Love Bees. So there's mention of one of them as well. There's other stuff on the page, but we really didn't need to get into it. There was more detail than this warranted. So I think that pretty much covers us. It's just, it's a little thing you can go and look at and then go, okay, and move on with your lives. (laughs) Pretty much. We needed to cover it because this is the last story in the graphic novel that we have to cover. And there's no way we could stretch this one page into a book club on its own. We are good, but we are not that good. No, we are not. Are we ready to take it home, Aaron? I am ready if you are, Krista. Let's go home. Uh, Thank you for joining us. Like we mentioned at the top of the show, you can find every episode to all of our shows on our website, halopodcastevolved.com. It also features links to our Discord server, Facebook group, Patreon page, Xbox Live Club, and all other contact information. Uh, Once again... Another special shout out to all of our patrons for supporting this show and making all of this possible. Head to patreon.com slash podcast evolved to learn more. And finally, if you want to leave us a voicemail about this episode, a previous episode or anything Halo related, please do not say anything not Halo related. And also know that if you do send a voicemail, it could possibly appear in a future episode unless explicitly asked not to. So just know that. Our number is 205-EVOLVED. That's 205-386-5833. And with that, I have been your host, Krista. And until next time, Evolved. 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 Evolved.